Hello and welcome in. Happy Sunday night to everyone watching. Good afternoon. Good evening. We are here. The walkthrough is back. I'm your host, intern Joe Machico. With me is my guest this week, the man, the myth, the legend. It's been a long, long time coming. Mr. Elijah Campbell of 107.5 The Game. Elijah, how are we doing this fine Sunday evening? Oh, sir, I am fantastic. This is a, it's a good day for sports talk because you know the weather wasn't like wasn't great today, and you got to sit inside for a little bit. You know, I've been chill, just chilling here, doing a bunch of laundry, watching the NBA and Stanley Cup playoffs, uh, kind of flipping back and forth between both, and kind of digesting all that we saw uh, yesterday. I did, I did the whole, you know, South Carolina Saturday. My dad came in town from Tennessee for for the weekend. We got tickets to. The baseball game, so we got to watch that, and then we went over to Willie B for the spring game last night and got to digest it a little bit. That was his first interaction, actually, his first his wow. uh, first experience in a SEC stadium that's not Neyland Stadium. Like he's born and raised, wow. you know, lived all of his entire life in East Tennessee, yeah. so he got to experience Willie B for the first time. He gave it two thumbs up. I, th I think he had a really good time. So that's we awesome. uh, we we got to digest a ton of South Carolina athletics this weekend. That's awesome. Sounds like an awesome trip for Papa Campbell making the trip down here. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, did you guys hit up the baseball game on Friday night? Uh, not Friday night. I actually, I took him to Village Idiot on Friday night. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was like, if I'm going to take you anywhere here in town, you know, it's got to be to where, you know, my favorite pizza place is. We're big, big, big pizza lovers. So he got oh, to uh, to get indoctrinized by what, like, you know, the, the Church of Village Idiot and Brian Glenn. So it was uh, that that was a blast. But we ended up listening to a lot of it, you know, on the radio. We drove around town a little bit. I was showing him some stuff. But we got to uh, get to listen on the radio to a, a whole lot of strikeouts and a whole lot of Hagen Smith doing Hagen Smith stuff. But so we consumed it, but yeah. we didn't go to it on Friday. Night. Absolutely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, well, we'll definitely break it all down here. Um, but I did want to. We'll start with the spring game, right? Spring football for South Carolina. Uh, capping off in a pretty good way as you mentioned elijah the atmosphere at Col or at uh, excuse me williams Place. i'm so long in life oh my gosh um no, this whole season's not been over for long sitting. so i don't blame you don't I know, blame, I know. Don't blame I know. it all i'm i'm very slowly thawing out from <laughs> this spring so i apologize no the the atmosphere at williams price was great um the atmospheres at founders park um you know all weekend was was fantastic i was there on friday night um, and again, we'll get to baseball, but appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, but yeah, starting with the spring game, Elijah, just right off the bat, uh, I did want to ask who stood out to you, right? Because the spring game, it's not really a complete kind of game, mm -hmm. but just right off the bat, I mean, who who stood out the most? I want to say Dylan Stewart. Uh, we're just watching that game. Look, there's a few positions on the field where, you know, you can't go, I don't want to say give 100% effort, but you can't exactly simulate like a Saturday night in the fall, right? Quarterback's mm -hmm. one of them. Because, you know, as big as the Norris Sellers is, there were a couple of times that were called sacked just because he got touched, even though in a real football game, you know, he could probably evade that, you know. So evaluating that can be pretty tough. But I was talking to Langston Moore on the show on Friday, you know, former, former Gamecock defensive lineman. It played in the NFL. And he said, you know, in a spring game, even if it's a spring game as a lineman, you know, it's kind of like being pregnant. You're not half pregnant or kind of pregnant. You are or you're not. So you're either playing football or you're not playing football on the line of scrimmage. So I, I took that, you know, as it is, and Dylan Stewart was able to get in the backfield a ton. It, he's one of those guys, too, you hear so much about because of his demeanor. And you heard Shane Beamer, you know, at the, I guess, introductory press conference for a lot of the newcomers, transfers, and signing class. And he talked about, you know, being in Dylan Stewart's home with uh, with other coaches, and he's eating his dinner while watching one of the Saw movies. So you're like, oh, my God, this guy is, like, kind of an animal. Well, Saturday night in a game like that, he was getting into the backfield at will. He was unblockable, and I thought that's a that's a, a different you know uh, a, a different animal. I for a, for a true freshman to be in that type of environment to simulate that against you know being guarded by players a lot older than him, I think he's got a head start. I think he absolutely looked the part of a five star freshman, and it was a whole lot of fun to get to see him kind of just do whatever he want off the edge. He, he's one of those guys that you hear a ton about when he was playing high school ball. But when you got to see him in person and get to see him in that type of environment, he, he really looks like the five-star guy that you're going to have come off the edge. I think that is a great sign for South Carolina. It's one of those things while watching, you know, it was, it was uh, refreshing to see somebody not have to go through, I guess, maybe a, a freshman struggle. Because, I mean, that honestly, throughout the entire game, I thought the most physically imposing player was Dylan Stewart. And I think that's a, an incredible sign for this yeah. defense moving forward. And that edge position – is going to be a fun position battle to watch whenever we do get to 
fall uh, practices, even though there's more like August, like summer practices. But once we get to that, it's going to be fun to see exactly who's going to be paired on the other side of the edge with him. Cause I truly believe yeah. it'll be Dylan Stewart to start the season. Yeah, really think so, Elijah. I agree. I, I, I agree with all of the praise for Dylan Stewart, right? The saw quote was a great one. And shout out to Sterling Lucas, right? A couple summers ago, he pulled me aside and told me like how good this kid is going to be and certainly called a yeah. shot, right? Dylan Lucas, to me right now, looks like a, the genie that came out of the bottle. Dylan Stewart, <laughs> he looks primed and ready to go. Just a lot more ready to go than I thought. And, I mean, we've seen a little bit, a couple clips in spring practice and stuff like that. But I think Dylan, if he's not starting week one, he's going to be in the nation. And then it's mm -hmm. just going to ramp up from there, right? I, I think we yeah. will see a lot of that um, just going forward. But, no, I agree. I think, you know, he was just a menace all day long. Um, and, and there was an injury to the offensive line, but it wasn't to the side that Dylan Stewart was attacking. But Marquis Anderson was held out because of back spasms, of, uh, which smart move. Again, you don't want a guy yeah. you know, playing in your spring game. Um, you know, reactivating something in his back. Um, and you, you want to hold Marquis out of that just – because, again, you you need him, right? But then Robbie Ashford was kind of running for his life a little bit more. Um, that was kind of a result of it. But, again, I think, you know, with Marquis, right, I think, you know, the back is something that you can try to figure out with a big fella you really, really want to take precautions with. But other than that, right, there's no other big injuries. Obviously, the running back, um, you know, Rockets being held out, Juju's being held out. Um, but I, I think other than uh, pretty, pretty good. And then I, again, I think with Marquis, it's just going to be, you know, something that she just monitored towards the summer. He's a big fella. So it could be something to watch, but I, I just, I don't, I don't think it's going to be that big of a, a question heading into summer camp. Yeah. And I think that uh, the biggest takeaway too, is you left without any serious injuries, back spasms, you know, just, yeah. it's one of those things like yeah. rest it, big man, rest it, <laughs> rest it. It's not worth yeah. re-aggravating it <laughs> in a spring game in which I don't know if you're going to be able to show that much more to your coaches than what you've already shown in the 14 spring practices leading to it. So yeah, like laying him out is the best thing to do. Even with the running backs, I'm not concerned about, you know, Rockets health. I think he'll be, I think he'll be ready by the time that, you know, fall camp rolls around and, you know, I, it's it's one of those things, too, that the spring game's fun because it, it kind of quenches our thirst for football a little bit. I know it did mine. I mean, I got really excited watching Lenora Sellers run for a touchdown, even though I know he can't actually be touched by a defensive player. I, it was still fun to get to watch. But it's one of those things, too, that, like, if you are even half injured, you don't play it. You don't play in that game. You, you need to make sure that you avoid all Jalen Nichols' experiences here and be able to make yeah. it into fall camp about as healthy as possible. So you, you take with it, you take the spring game with a grain of salt, but because a lot of guys aren't able to, you know, completely go. I know Judge Collier missed a good chunk of it as well. And if if, if there's even a chance that, to aggravate an injury, you, you don't push it in that situation. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I love, I love your point on rest it. Um, absolutely. Rest it. Yeah. So, yeah. 100%. Uh, so we're going to pause the the football. I do want to bring up these comments um, um, from Craig talking about the atmosphere at Founders Park. Craig, we're going to get to this when we get into baseball, mm -hmm. but I agree. I was there on Friday um, and the atmosphere was, I thought great from the start on Friday. Um, but again, we, we can get into the atmosphere and, and pick apart, I guess, the loonies, if you will, um, at, at Founders Park as, as we get through football. But I see it, and we're, we're going to get to it, believe me. I would love to talk about it. Um, but so, yeah, going back to the spring game, um, I did want to talk about Dante Reno a little. Uh, kid bounced back. He looked really good. Uh, Mike asked me on Tuesday when we were doing Talking Tuesdays who I thought would, you know, I guess shine the most in the spring game. My pick was Dante Reno. Um, he had the one pick, but – in, in reality, and in, if you look at this from a big lens, I still think that the pick holds through. I think Dante showed quite a bit, um, you know, to, to D'Lo and to these quarterbacks, uh, these other quarterbacks too, just battling back, being able to score on that next drive, um, you know, for his team, and, you know, really showed some poise. I, I thought, you know, he was a little bit more developed than we thought. A kid that's supposed to be a senior in high school right now, um, you know, really showed that that he's capable of the moment and, and bigger than kind of what he was being brought in. So super proud of Dante for what he did out there. Yeah, exactly. And the interception, too, I mean, I think you kind of have to give credit to the corner who made the play. Like, Vakari Swain made an awesome play, man. I mean, that's one of those things that when, when you tip a ball like that, it's hard to maintain, like, your focus as you're going to the ground with it, it's a, it was an athletic play. It was a, a fine athletic play. And yeah, like it's, it's good to see Dante Reno, at least when you're, when you're this young, that's the thing, looking at the freshman in this game, I thought, you know, Thompson had some ups and downs at the line, but showed some promise, you know, and Stewart, I thought was probably the most standout player of the entire game, but Reno, I, I think held his own. And when you're a 18 year old quarterback 
playing a, a spring game against other grown adults, basically on the other side of the, of the line of scrimmage, if you can hold your own, like there's going to be time to learn a lot of other stuff, like concepts, like reading in a, a college defense, being able to not get fooled by what the other team is playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage pre-snap. There's, uh, there's time to learn that, right? And when you have an OC like, you know, Dow Loggins, who has done this at the highest level, you're going to learn that eventually. And I think what you saw in Reno is a good foundation. You have a foundation where he's cool, he's calm, collected. He can make college football throws. But I think we're just yeah. going to have to get to a point. He's, there's gonna, the learning curve is going to be learning the concepts, learning defensive coverages at the next level, which isn't out of the realm of possibility for him to even learn quickly. It's, but it's good to see exactly that there is at least a foundation of being a solid quarterback you know, for the future. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I agree completely. And, you know, I think the quarterback battle between Robbie Ashford and Lenore Sellers, if you will, that that we were kind of getting mm -hmm. maybe hoping to get a glimpse of, right, was a little incomplete because of the Mark Anderson thing. Um, yeah. But so out of all the quarterbacks, I think Lenore's did well, and we'll break down him for sure. Uh, but I guess the, the 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 knight in shining armor, if you will, the person that has come through the rubble was Dante Reno. And again, happy that that his performance because again i mean last season we look at the spring game right and it was lenore sellers kind of stuff in that secondary you know quarterback role right and so mm -hmm. um even though robbie ashford didn't get the same um thing and I, I fully expect robbie to be number two on the depth chart they made a pretty good case for the reason you know why he's here and, and why yeah. he's getting all the hype coming into it um is is the biggest thing so shout out to dante for that but then as we are on the topic of quarterbacks um lenore sellers looked pretty darn good uh, yeah. you know, missed a couple of throws, but I, I mean, personally, the biggest thing that stood out for me for myself and Elijah, I'll get your take here, uh, but is, is his legs. He did so much yeah. with his legs. He's a lot more mobile than the last time we saw him, which is crazy because he's still, he's still big. He's still like his frame looks great, but he was just a lot more mobile. Yeah. Oh, and here's the thing too. I think what you at least got to see in a spring game, because again, mm -hmm. they're the quarterbacks aren't live, so you can't tackle them. So it, it does give you an incomplete picture but what i really liked seeing from from lenoris was his ability to understand when the pocket's collapsing and when the pressure's coming and where it's coming from here's the thing a lot of quarterbacks have that peripheral view of you know that pressure is coming but not all of them know the angle where it's coming from he slipped out of a bad pocket a few times and on the touchdown run he saw the pressure is coming from the outside because you know josiah had kyle Kennard down on the down on the ground or closer to about like you know the left side of his hip and he took off the other way. And I, I think that's something that if you're going to be a starting quarterback in the SEC, you're going to see mixtures of blitzes. You're going to see different, you know, uh, all, all types of different looks. And the pocket's going to break down. Even if you have a really good offensive line, there are enough good defensive lines in the SEC that you're going to see, including ones at LSU, including ones at Ole Miss, who, I don't know if you noticed, just completely re rechanged their defensive roster in the transfer portal with all SEC caliber players. That pocket's yeah. going to collapse from different angles, and if you're Lenore Sellers and you're that you're that big, you are that fast, and you are that gifted athletically, one of the things that's hard for a lot of players like that to be able to pick up is the sense of pressure, knowing where uh, the pocket's breaking down and being able to run. It's what makes Lamar Jackson so good, right? There are a lot of quarterbacks who are as athletic as Lamar Jackson, but not many have that pro pocket presence to know that if you know your pressure breaks down, uh, your protection breaks down on certain sides of the line where to find the hole, where to be able to, you know, exploit it for your, you know, your gain for a first down, knowing when to run, knowing when to pass and knowing when the pocket is a complete waste. And I think Lenoris at least was able to show that even in like the tiny glimpse that we got to see just because like I said, quarterbacks aren't live, but I thought that was a, that was a really good sign to be able to get to, to see him understand when it's time to take off and run or when it's time to sit in the pocket, maybe try to break down the defense a little bit when it comes to, maybe pocket passing. We didn't get to learn a lot, but I liked how, you know, I think one thing we are going to see a lot that we saw in the spring game is the short, quick hitting passing game. Cause you've got a lot of quick athletic receivers. Gage Larvidan's one of those guys. Luke Doty, I think plays really well in that five to 10 yard range. Uh, Jared Brown the guy is certainly, I mean, this guy who's, you know, average depth of target was like five and a half yards at coastal Carolina. You're going to see a lot of that. And I think he was really accurate in the short range, uh, short range where he can run like a West coasty type of offense and, and feel pretty confident that he's going to be able to do what he needs to. So I thought that was when watching sellers play, those were really the initial things that came to my mind. 
Yeah, absolutely. No, I love it, Elijah. And you know, the bucket presence, that's a great point because, yeah, he just looked comfortable. And mm-hmm. with the offensive line being as up and down as it has been, especially with what you saw last year, that's exactly what you want, right? That's the first quality after watching all of last season's tape, right? That's that's mm-hmm. what you would want of your quarterback, you know, coming into this year. And we we know how dynamic he is with Norm um, and stuff like that. But um, I, I still think Robbie Ashford has a, has a shot to knock. I, I don't think the, the conversation is over quite yet. Right. I still right. think, he's, you know, and, and from what we saw, again, it was it was a, a piece of what it was because, you know, Marky Anderson was out and he was essentially running for his life. Um, but so it, it'll be interesting. A lot of people brought up Luke Doty um, won an award. I think it was a spirit award or Mr. Gamecock, Burley says, um, and they deserve it. Right. Luke Doty mm-hmm. is becoming the, I guess, captain, if you would, the de facto captain of this team. Um, whether you like it or not, uh, you know, a kid really loves the state of South Carolina and really loves this program. I think, you know, he's exactly what you need to be in the foxhole with these receivers, right? Gage Larva Dane, all these receivers. Um, and then you have a guy like Nick Carver coming up and then, you know, you have the veteran piece. It's like the NBA locker room almost in that mm-hmm. wide receiver room. Yeah, it really is. And here's the thing about Luke that I really love is because he has that background as a quarterback, you know. So he's yeah, he, he knows right. exactly what a quarterback's looking for when you're running routes, where the ball's supposed to be placed. He knows where it's supposed to be placed, where it's taught to be placed. He's got a really good athletic base, and I think he runs routes pretty well, especially for somebody who maybe not be trained to be a wide receiver. He does run routes really well. And, you know, he's got that type of build. You know, I don't want to make a direct comparison, but if you watch how the Saints use Taysom Hill, I think you can really yeah. see a lot of Taysom Hill-like stuff with Luke Doty. And it's not just because he's, you know, a, a big white wide receiver who used to play quarterback, but there is like a little bit of a shared skill set here that I think his background as a quarterback is going to help him a lot with. And my favorite thing about Luke Doty isn't just that, you know, positional versatility where he knows exactly what a wide receiver is looking for in a quarterback and vice versa. But he's been here the entire time that Shane Beamer's been here, right? Like he, Shane, after the game, talked about some of the seniors they have that stayed. He's got about, what, four or five guys that are on this team that have been there ever since Shane got there, and that's been there the entire time. And I think one really, really big thing about that, why that's a huge plus, is that Luke Doty has seen a lot of change in this program. He, he knows exactly – also what Shane wants in terms of building your culture to get it to where it needs to be to be successful. So having that, that camaraderie, that, you know, being on the same page with your coach like that as a player who is so multi-positional and versatile and has the ear of the younger teammates, that's vital. Shane needs that, you know, Dowell needs that. That, that, that is probably one of the more valuable parts of Luke that might not be discussed as much. Yeah, and because you can be a player's coach all you want, right? But you mm-hmm. still need a player that's still in in touch and, and still in the foxhole with those guys. So that's that's also a really really good point, Elijah. Uh, so I guess moving on from the wide receivers, a lot of talk about the tight ends. I was also impressed with the tight ends. Um, but Martin says Maurice Brown, Simon, Brady Hunt all made nice catch and runs, and then some mm-hmm. love for the walk on tight end here um, from Craig as well. But I I was also impressed with the tight end room. This tight end room, and I mean, and I'll go as far as say the defensive end too. But something that that compares the two of them or binds the two of them is they look the part now, right? Josh Simon right. certainly had looked the part. Trey Knox certainly looked the part. But across the board on on the line, you you're starting to look the part, right? You you are at the point in in the Shane Beamer regime, right, where you're starting to get offensive linemen and defensive linemen, and, and you know, just across the board on the line that look like linemen, right? Um, and I'm mm-hmm. not saying that any of the guys that were in here weren't. But you you you're just fully stocked in, in dudes that, that have the build of an SEC player. Um, but so uh, I, I agree with Martin here. Give give the walk on tight end a scholarship. Absolutely, I'm with it. You need as much depth as you can get. But um, I thought Brady Hunt. I mean, in particular for for people that stood out, I, I think both your starting tight ends looked good. Brady Hunt, Josh mm-hmm. Simon, uh, they're going to be a really dynamic duo um, come come summer, come come fall. So I was impressed with the tight end play as well. Joe, I think the one player that I think I'm excited about him like the most on this offense is Josh Simon. And he got to he yeah. got to make it, you know, some nice moves once he got the ball in his hands. And that's what makes him so good, right? Like Josh Simon might not win any awards for his route running. He might not win any rewards with his hands in terms of making like a sports center top 10 play. But when the ball's in yeah. this guy's hands, he knows exactly what to do with it. And he is not afraid of contact. And he might be for the best. 
that this, for the safeties and the corners, maybe some of the linebackers, that Josh Simon didn't get too many opportunities to run with the ball because he's yeah. not afraid to bury somebody in the open field. And he's been very yeah. vocal about it. He loves to run through somebody, not just run around them. Yeah. He is a physical runner with the football, and I love when he gets the ball in space. And I think in the offense that Dallas is going to want to build around, whether it be Lenore, who I think it's going to be. And I think most of us here, yeah. whether it be me, you, everybody in the chat, everybody that yeah. follows his team, knows it's probably going to be Lenoris. But even if Robbie Ashford's the quarterback, you're going to have a lot of quick hitters. You're going to be able to run maybe a more West Coasty type offense. And if that's the case, getting somebody like Josh Simon, who's a good route runner between zero to five yards, who is that good with the ball in his hands, who is athletic to be able to gain extra yards while also being physical enough to break tackles, or as we saw in the Florida game this past year, you know, put somebody inside the dirt near the red zone. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a huge Josh Simon truther. And I, I would I, like, Brady Hunt, I thought, had a really solid game in, in our, our walk on does need a scholarship. I completely agree. But uh, I, it all starts and ends with someone like Josh Simon, who I think is going to be seeing a big statistical uptick. Maybe not like Xavier Leggett from 22 to 23, but we're going to see Josh Simon be able to put up some pretty fun numbers that it might not be as expected coming into the season. But I think you'll get it. I think he will. Yeah. Absolutely. Not there because, again, I think, you know, I, he's got to stay healthy. He's had some injury issues in mm-hmm. the past. And when you hit like Josh Simon does, um, you know, you, you, you just you need as much ice as you can get in the training center um, to, to bump <laughs> up those bruises. But I think, yes. you know, and, and, you know, Simon's leading the way and it, it's exactly how Trey Knox did it last year. You have two transfer tight ends in the room, one of them fresher than the other one. Um, and so he's doing, he's laying out or, or essentially doing the, the Trey Knox or treating Brady, Brady Hunt like Trey Knox did, um, you know, when Simon got here. So I think it's great. I, I love Josh Simon. He's a great character too. Um, and then he's just continuing to elevate Brady Hunt's game, right? Cause Brady Hunt was just big tight end from the Midwest. Now he's getting mm-hmm. mean, right? Now he's getting, you know, mean, learn how to play SEC. So I think that, that pairing, it's like the Bash brothers, man. It's going to be really, <laughs> really fun to watch, um, when, when we get into the, in the, in the fall. Absolutely. And look, here's the thing. There's always a spot at any point in the game for 12 personnel, which means, you know, you could, you, yeah. you could, you could use two tight ends. And if, if Arthur Smith in my time covering the Tennessee Titans taught me anything, it's that sometimes 12 personnel is your best package. And that's usually if you need to get four yards, doing something in 12 personnel with a couple of good tight ends is the way to go. And if Brady Hunt can prove that he can block, he can run good routes in the short, you know, in short distances, or he's been able to at least make a tough catch on third and four when you just need four yards. It's go, it, like that's complimentary football, and, and he can be complimentary to Josh Simon because they are two different types of, of tight ends. And that diversity can help you in an offense like this where you have a good running game because I love the way the running back room looks. I loved how Oscar Attaway looked in terms of being multidimensional yesterday. Jawarn yeah. Howell. Uh, I saw that that name in, in the chat. I completely agree. I thought yep. Howell looked really good whenever he got the ball. You know, your running game is so good to the point right now that if you, I think this, I think the one thing that this offense is going to be better at in mm-hmm. 2024 than it was 2023, I think it's short yardage conversions. I think you're going to yeah. be a lot better because the a the health of the offensive line, b you can run some 12 personnel because I like how about both those tight ends complement complement each other, and c, in three, you know, like look, you have a full uh, running back room with different types of runners and running backs who also have different skill sets. So I think that was a, uh, I think that's one thing about this offense that we are actually starting to learn a little bit that might be able to take a little bit of a jump in 24. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. I think, you know, the short yardage is, is really it. Cause there's never a bad time for 12 personnel. Um, uh-uh. if, if you ask me, um, so I, I love that. And yes, Simon J. Diz, appreciate you checking in as always. Simon was split out some. He might be that red zone guy. Yeah, big target. Either one, too, right? Because Hunt's, yes. Hunt's a little thicker um, than Simon is, but Simon has a little bit more length. Just either one of them, right? I think, you know, it's 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 going to be good. Yeah, Hutch says tight end coach did good in the spring game mm-hmm. as hearing that the tight end coach or that the tight end did great. Yeah, absolutely. He did. It is great to have Sean Elliott back in Columbia. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And uh, A, you love Sean Elliott coming back to Columbia because he's an energy guy, and that's a guy I would like to run through a brick wall for. You know, so that for one, yeah. that's a good sign, right? And then two, you know, the tight ends are, go- are going to be able to block. And here's the thing, if you play for Sean Elliott, you're going to learn how to bleep and block, man. Like that's, yeah. that, that is the, your, your first job is to block. Your second job is to block. Your third job is to block. And your fourth job is to catch passes. So we do yes. know that these guys are going to be able to put bodies on somebody to improve the run game. 
And then when you're in the game too, it's not going to be a complete obvious, you know, note what you're going to do with the ball. Like there are some tight ends, you see this in the NFL all the time, that don't want to touch anybody. But when they're in the game, you know they're there to catch the ball. <clears throat> Darren Waller. Uh, you know they're there to catch the ball and that's it. But you can play you can play 12 personnel and both those guys be exceptional blockers. Maybe have somebody run. And interesting thing with Simon, you know, I, I do like the the comment, you know, about him playing out some. And Look, and, and, and that's great. You need somebody who can take reverses, who are able to uh, go outside and create mismatches, you know, because you're not going to put a corner out there on Josh Simon. But the versatility that Simon gives you, the skill set that Brady Hunt has, and then the coaching ability of Sean Elliott, knowing that if you're going to play for Sean Elliott, you are going to block for somebody, makes you got to feel, it makes you have to feel a whole lot better about the tight end room than you did last year, even though I thought Trey Knox is probably more gifted athletically. Than anybody in the room is now. I think just the way you have the room uh, configured out right now has to make you feel good about it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if I could play for Sean Elliott. I, I don't know if no. I have the mental strength <laughs> to play for Sean Elliott. It's something we were we were kicking around on the beat. It's like I would love to play for a guy like Sterling Lucas. Um, you know, just uh, it, it seems like he would push you right in the in the right mm -hmm. ways. But Sean Elliott is one tough mf'er, and I don't know if I could withstand playing for him it would be close right I, I think i could make it very very like i i don't know but the, it's it's tough but um yeah, i i like this comment from martin too because mike furry's the same way about blocking on the mm -hmm. outside mike furry's like a carbon copy of sean elliott just a wider a little bit short in a wide receivers version who led the nfc in receiving in 2006 i believe for the lions mike furry is a also another bad mf -er who is you know he's yeah. jack right you want to see your wide receivers coach just jacked and getting in guys' faces. I think it's exactly what the room needs too. Um, mm -hmm. But Martin, I'm glad you brought up Mike Furry because it's somebody I certainly wanted to bring up as well. Yeah, absolutely. And like that's that's the thing about uh, about Furry is I love his background. Like that's a guy that was an undersized, under overlooked player coming out of college, and yeah. he had to really fight his way on. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a bad team or not. Like in the NFL, you're in the NFL and leading in, you know, in any statistical category is a big deal. The guy knows how to be physical. He knows how to get the best out of his players. And I, that's, it, it, we'll, we'll see how the development goes because I think wide receivers probably one of the biggest question marks, obviously quarterback nationally, when people from the national standpoint, look at South Carolina, they're going to ask about the quarterback. But I think here locally, we have a good idea of what Lenora Sellers is and what he can be. But when it comes to wide, rec wide receivers having maybe a downfield threat, what exactly you have in Larvidan and Jared Brown and how they're able to maybe make that jump from playing, you know, G5 football to the SEC is always a question. But if Furry can get the most out of, the, out of those guys to be you know, block, be physical, run crisp routes, be able to assimilate into the offense that L Loggins is going to want it to be, is going to be crucial. I think if you want to talk about the most important position groups on this team right now, without obviously quarterback being the obvious answer, Mike Furry and the wide receivers are, it's got to be the biggest, uh, you know, answer to that for me, just because you need a group of guys that can at least add elements to your offense and you need them to be tough. And, and like, you know, or, you know, Martin said, if they can block on the outside, it's going to only help even more strengthen the strength of your offense, which is going to be the running game. Yeah, absolutely. Which is crazy to sit here and say after watching all of the last two seasons, you've been abysmal in the run game for the last two years. But now, again, knock on wood with everyone and, and healthy and everything like that. But um, now you look pretty good entering a, a summer camp with, you know, a fully healthy running back room or should be a fully healthy running back room when you get to summer camp. Oscar Attaway looked good. I saw a comment about Jawan Howell. Looks great. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to be excited about in this running back room. Um, Elijah, as we wrap up kind of the, the spring game coverage, um, is one, cause I know we've talked about pretty much every position group across the board, but is there one position group that you still like are, are questioning or need to see more out of, or just kind of have your eye on the end of summer camp? It's going to be the wide receivers. I, I think that's yeah. really going to be the biggest thing because in the spring game, I think Dow Loggins was very true to his word. He didn't lie to anybody when he said that this offense was yeah. going to be vanilla ice cream, right? It's like there was nothing down the field. I think Lenora's threw one pass that might have traveled more than 10 air yards, and that was on the rollout. So we didn't yeah. get much of a sample size there. I think Robbie Ashford threw that one pass that was intended to Brady Hunt in the end zone. That might have been his only attempt outside of maybe 10 air yards. He didn't show you much in terms of what the downfield passing attack is. I, I think you need to have that, though. You need to have somebody who can stretch the field. And while I love – you know, the the type of receivers that they add in the transfer portal, whether it be Amari Huggins, Bruce, whether it be Jared Brown, Gage Larvidan. Jared Brown's a slot receiver, right? Gage Larvidan's a guy who split almost evenly 
but I would like to be able to see them stretch the field because you've got to have big playability. I don't know exactly what the status right now. That might be a summer project for me is to be able to find statistically what, how likely are you to win the game if you win the explosive play battle. So that's what, over yeah. 15 yards of a pass play, over 10 yards on a run play. Mm-hmm. While I love this team's ability as of now to be able to kind of nickel and dime somebody down the field and get into the red zone where you can use maybe a Josh Simon, your Rocket Sanders, or a Lenore Sellers, you know, keep you sneak into the end zone. Yeah. You got to be able to to beat someone over the head with a nine iron and make a really big play down the field with an outside receiver or, you know, maybe a running back in space. And that's the thing right now is I want to see who in this wide receiver room can get you that big play ability, right? Like, the difference between yeah. South Carolina's offense being really bad and really good in this past year when you saw their Jekyll and Hyde this wasn't just the offensive line's ability to keep Spencer Rattler upright, but it was Xavier Leggett's ability to be able to stretch the field and make teams have to respect the downfield threat. Who's yeah. going to be able to do that in this wide receiver room I think is going to be one of the more intriguing things to me to be able to help gauge exactly what the ceiling of this offense is because I think I have an understanding of what the floor is, which is fine. Mm-hmm. But if you want to be able to contend in the SEC, you got to be able to have teams – respect you from 20 some odd yards down the field yeah absolutely no i love that and i firmly agree i think wide receivers the one room that we really didn't get any clarification on um you know or really any just you know because we don't we don't we don't necessarily know if or who i mean i'm sure internally they know who that guy Mm -hmm. is right that they're gonna throw the deep ball to i'm sure inter or maybe they have an idea but they, I mean, like like you said, all vanilla ice cream, right? So we didn't mm-hmm. get to see much. We don't know who the the next Xavier or the, whoever it is, right? Is it going to be Jared Brown? Is it going to be uh, Gabe every day? We don't know, right? The, mm-hmm. the the guy that they are calling, whoever, whoever number it is, right? Nick Harbor still in the mix too, right? Still yep. dominating track, record third third fastest um, two hundred time in school history. I think it was. He's a freak. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And the fact that he still has a chance to make the Alisa summer is also ridiculous. I think that would be so sick, side little Nick Harbor tangent. But, um, no, I, I agree. I think there's just so much more. We, we we just don't know who's getting their number called when it's like, all right, go time. Time to throw a bomb. Like, right? So, yeah, I, I think that's mm-hmm. one of the unfortunate things that came out of spring ball. But we'll, we'll see. There's a lot of dudes in that room. Yeah. Oh, oh, there is. There, there, I think there's a lot of dudes and there's not a lot of uh, role placement and separation that we know of yeah. yet, right? You know, obviously yep. not all the practices were open to the goobers and the media like us to be able to pinpoint and see exactly, you know, who's going to be playing where. But that's going to be – that's a big task for the summer for, for Dow Loggins and the, the offensive coaching staff is really figuring out who's this guy that we can trust with a pass down the field whenever the, you know, the box is loaded and we can get one-on-ones on the outside. Because you got to have somebody to be able to do that. Defenses have to be able to respect that element of your game, or else every team that goes into playing you is just going to load up that bleeping box and make you have to to make a play on the perimeter. I think Nick Harbor can be that guy, but then that's where the development's going to have to be seen. That's where Mike Ferry's job is. Uh, that's where he's going to earn his keep. He's going to earn that contract is to be able to get that type of development from somebody. And it look. It might have even been hard to tell in the spring game because I thought the secondary did play really well. I know we have a comment here about, you know, the the pass breakup by Nick Evan Worry in the end zone at the very end of the first half. And that was my favorite play of the game. Uh, but like I thought the secondary played really well. But if we're going to see what this offense truly is, I think we got to be able to find out who's stretching the defense when we get into the season. Yeah, no, I agree fully. Elijah, anything else before we kind of close out? I know we're going to talk some recruiting here in a second, mm-hmm. but uh, any anything else from guys that are on the team already? In terms, in terms of the guys on the team right now, I think we know exactly what we thought we did going into the spring game, which still offensively yeah. limited. But I think you know some of the guys that you, you can trust. I think we feel like Lenora Sellers is going to be QB1, barring any – crazy development from Robbie Ashford or a really good couple weeks of camp going into the regular season. I feel pretty solid about that. I think, you know, we're like Oscar Attaway looks the way I thought he would, you know, even the rocket Sanders is probably going to get the lion's share of carries. I think we know, we know a lot of that. We still don't know much about receiver defensively. I think your strength is still going to be on the line. I, I still want to, you know, give Tonka Hemingway a shout out because I thought he was everywhere defensively. And I think Dylan Stewart's going to take one edge and more than likely be Kyle Kennard on the other. But if Dylan Stewart plays like that, you're in pretty damn good shape, regardless of who's on the other side of the defensive line with him. And, you know, I don't think we learned a ton about the linebacking core, but I thought Nick Emmett-Worry was much better in coverage 
in this game than he looked at, at times a lot last year. If he makes that jump in his game, because he's already a great tackling safety, he's already probably has one of the best ranges athletically of a lot of safeties in this conference right now. But if he can prove where he can play a little bit of nickel corner, I think he's going to be an all SEC caliber talent and is going to be able to help keep you in a lot of games because teams aren't going to be able to try to mismatch hunt against you this year like they did last year when Florida basically just said, okay, we're going to get Ricky Pearsall in one of these uh, nickel corners and we're going to pick them apart down the field, which they did. I think if there's a, you're able to show some of that that growth, like with what Emin Worry displayed in the end zone at the end of the first half, you're going to be in a lot better position and you're not going to feel like a team that went five and seven and lost the players you did going into 24. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I love all of that. I agree with everything you saw Dylan Thornton. And then also the matchup thing is another good point too. Um, you know, you should feel a lot, a lot more sound um, D, at your DBs. Zabari Sandy mm-hmm. looked great. Um, you know, they're just a Vakari Swain as well. So yeah, you're at a good game. You, you're, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So you're you're loving what you're seeing from these guys that T. Gray continues to produce and continues to recruit. It's crazy. I mean, we could we could talk for like another thirty minutes about how good Torian Gray is and and, and how, I love Torian how well Gray. he's recruiting and producing talent. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but. We're not. We are going to talk about a little bit of recruiting. It was a big, big weekend um, for for South Carolina with guys on campus. Most notably, David Sanders, offensive lineman from North Carolina, coming out um, from the state up there, um, or further, a little bit north. Um, but yeah, so David Sanders, Elijah, how big would would a get like this be? And then also, what have you heard from this weekend? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I've not heard a ton of of recruiting intel. Yeah. But here's the thing with recruiting too. Recruiting high schoolers, whether it be football, basketball, baseball, whatever, a lot of it is buy-in, right, and a lot of program momentum. you got to be able to convince a really talented 16-, 17-, 18-year-old that your program's in the right direction or you can trust them or they they can trust you for the next one, two, three, four years, four years, you know, at best, uh, of their college career to develop them into what they truly want, which is going to be an opportunity at the next level, or to be able to at least maximize their talents right now. And, you know, I've been an 18 year old once, Joe, you've been an 18 year old once. Anybody who's watching this is either 18 or has been 18 or is about to be 18. Uh, you know, exactly that, uh, those kids that you need, you need to be sold on something. Right. And the fact that there's a lot of good recruiting momentum, the South Carolina program right now, after a five and seven season, that wasn't exactly very glorious and that wasn't, you know, that had a lot of really low lows. It was a tough year. It was a year where you underachieved and that any other, you know, high school player can look at, look at you and say, look, Oh, look, you're five and seven. I'm not going to, I like there are other schools in the SEC. It's got a lot of momentum. I can hashtag come to the sip and play for Lane Kiffin and have a really cool video made about me, or I can go, you know, play at Alabama or if I'm, you know, if you're competing with like the Arkansas or whatever, like, uh, insert SEC school here. You got to be able to convince them that you got the program in the right moment, uh, in the right direction. And I think with the amount of visits they had this week, there are plenty of, of, of players that had, you know, um, that had uh, that had visits this week. We had a commitment this week. I think just then, in Ooh. terms of recruitment, the, the the more yeah, the more that you can get, the better by just being able to get more bodies here, right? And the like Jay Phillips says it on our show all the time, more good players. Anytime you can just get more good players, you know, you're you're doing pretty good. And to be able to attract talent into your building for your spring game, despite being five and seven the year before, when it can be really easy to be down on this program, I think speaks volumes of at least the type of um, recruiters that this team has on its staff. Yeah, absolutely. No, I completely agree. Um, as you mentioned, Elijah, there were two commitments Defensive back, four-star Shamari Earls. That's the big one. Everyone is mm-hmm. just very hyped up about. I've watched. I watched the kids tape um, a little bit last night and leading into this weekend. Big commitment there. I think that kid. Again, we talked about T. Gray. Um, it was a little mm-hmm. bit of a segue in for Shamari Earls. That this kid is supposed to be really, really good. So um, he committed early to. I think early enough to the point where you know he's going to continue to help build this class. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's another good thing. Uh, Batman Gummies is really impressed with the front seven. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, Cam Pringle did, uh, he, he looked good out there on Saturday. And he was also hosting uh, David Sanders as well, which I think, you know, should help. But in, in terms of the, the David Sanders recruitment, I think 
this goes one of two ways, right? I think you either laid a really good foundation and he's, it, it makes it really, really hard to forget South Carolina, or he goes to these mm-hmm. big schools and compares it back to South Carolina. Do I think that South Carolina is in a good spot for David Sanders? I think you did as best as you could for this weekend, right? I think it went mm-hmm. as good as you could have hoped. Right? And there's, there's, I don't think there's anything else you can do if you're South Carolina at this point, right? Because all the big dogs are mm-hmm. going to come get their piece, right? He's visiting Georgia, Alabama. Um, I think he's mixed there too. Uh, but yeah, so all, all the big dogs are going to come knocking Ole Miss. Um, so I think you made a pretty darn good impression with Sanders, but, yeah. and we'll say it's still a long road to go, but, um, certainly good to get, um, the commitment from Earl's. And then you also added a, another commitment from a defensive tackle, three-star Caleb Williams. No, not that Caleb Williams, but Caleb Williams defensive tackle. I, again, another guy with high upside. Um, three-star kid, but again, um, good to get a commit. And then you can always go from there, right? He's got a good frame on him as well. Um, so again, pretty decent weekend recruiting and, and all reports. I mean, for you did as much as you could with David Sanders. Um, so hopefully again, you, you make that lasting impression there. Um, but Elijah, um, any, anything else before we head hit baseball? I will say the one last thing for the players that did visit this week, South Carolina's got a lot of really cool recruiting advantages, and that's getting to hang out with Don Staley on the sideline, um, who star as a person who's an absolute icon in her sport has never been higher. So you got her parading around on the sidelines. You have the South Carolina video team, which I think you can compare with almost anybody in the country with that in terms of how they help production. Like, look, Saturday was a spring game. But it was really cool to hear, you know, to see the entrance, you know, to hear 2001, to hear Sandstorm all the time. For anybody who's coming to play there, that leaves a really good lasting impression. I can tell you right now, 18-year-olds love that type of stuff. 18-year-old me love that type of stuff, enamored with that type of stuff in terms of presentation, in terms of, you know, momentum. Uh, it was I was talking with my dad who was I was there at the game, you know, with, and I was like, uh, my dad, you know, we watched that video presentation before the game started. My dad goes, wow, that was pretty impressive. I was like, yeah, you would never know this team went five and seven last year, right? Like this, the university and the athletic department, I think does a really good job of putting on a show to make it really enticing to want to play there. And I think that's a good base of any type of recruitment is to be able to display a type of environment that you're going to want to play in and play in front of. And I think that that whole point was brought across really well, even for a spring game. So if there's anything that I think, you know, recruiting wise, that you can take away from the players that got to make that visit. That's it. I think that's a really convincing pitch for a lot of players uh, to be able to want to play for you because, you know, no matter how much we get taken away from what we originally thought the fabric of college football was uh, because of NIL or the transfer portal, one thing that's always going to be the same is the atmosphere. One thing that's always going to be the same is the, the fan commitment to the cloth and the Jersey and the helmet that's being worn. And I think you got a good feel of that on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. And I think, you know, there, I saw a bunch of tweets with recruits just hanging out with Don Saley. Um, yeah. so that's certainly a big selling piece. Mm-hmm. I know Lamont was certainly t- sending his pitch to David Sanders, uh, possibly another big man for Lamont in the future. Um, but we shall see. Mike, Michael, yeah, why not? Uh, Michael says Vicar Swain is going to be central. You absolutely I agree. He also asked, I was wondering if the receivers couldn't get open or did our or did our QBs just want to run? I think it was more of the pocket presence, um, like Elijah mentioned earlier. Um, you know, these guys are just wanted to take off, don't want to make the, the dumb decision in the spring game or like try to force something in the spring game. That is not the, the time for something. Uh, you know, you, you can take more risks in the summer ball, but I think everyone was just being a little bit more conservative. Uh, William mm-hmm. says, except Tennessee, most game winnable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, Elijah, transitioning into baseball a little bit. Uh, South Carolina, okay weekend. Uh, you know, you, you, you wound up losing the series to Arkansas, but, uh, you know, you, you won, you took at least one game, which was big. Um, Friday night, well, I guess we'll, we'll start with Friday night. I was there and the atmosphere was, was great on Friday night throughout, um, to Craig's point. Uh, again, I wasn't there for the rest of, of the games, but, um, yeah, Friday night was, was incredible, but you just couldn't get the job done there in the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that and here's the thing. It's the thing that has plagued this team when it comes to their their plate presence. Like while they draw a ton of walks, which is huge, on base percentage is a good correlation to winning baseball games. But they, this team this team leaves a lot of runners on base, and when you leave runners on base by way of striking out, then you can't like here's the thing about baseball. There's a lot of luck involved, and when you play a sport that's got high sample size, sometimes luck can be the difference between winning one run games and losing one run games. 
But when you strike out 17 times, you don't allow the element of luck to creep in, right? You don't let the other team have errors. Um, like I Jay Phillips says all the time, there's a reason the box score has uh, runs, hits, and errors. It's because errors can help change the, the way of the game. And in game one, yeah, I get it because you're faced off against Hagan Smith, who's easily the best pitcher in college baseball, and he struck out 11 batters by himself. But the Arkansas bullpen got six strikeouts as well. And when you're getting runners on base, but you're not able to bring them home because you're striking out, it's going to kill you. It, here's the thing. You put the ball in play, certain things can happen. A shortstop can botch it. Uh, you know, you might be able to have an outfielder lose one in the lights, or, you know, maybe you just put enough on the ball to bloop one over the third baseman's head. Luck can happen that way if you're able to at least get a bat on the ball. But the more you're striking out, especially with runners in scoring position, then you eliminate any chance of luck happening. I think Friday was a big example of you got dominated by a really good pitching staff, and while you do a really good job of drawing walks as a, as a hitting lineup, you can't have 17 strikeouts in a game and expect to beat anybody. And I think that was really where, what really plagued them Friday night. I thought the pitching staff was good in terms of keeping them in check. Roman Kimball, in the limited time that we got to see him, pitched really well, and it's very unfortunate the thumb injury got him out early. But I thought Ty Good came in and, and was serviceable, and I thought everybody that came in and pitched was serviceable. Even if no one put it together any type of eye-popping stat line, they were serviceable. And at this point in the season, I think we know who a lot of these guys are. None of them are going to win Cy Youngs in the future. But you need them to be serviceable, to be able to allow your hitters to win you games. And I think Friday night, you were, you had that. You had that in your pitching staff. But you're just not going to win games when you're striking out that many times. Yeah, most definitely. One baseball question. That was where it was Dylan Brewer this weekend. And that's a good point. A.B. Austin Brindling made the start. Um, center field Brewer. I think, I think it was just a matter of giving a B a nod rather than Brewer being mm -hmm. out. Um, I think, you know, Kingston just wanted to make a switch. I personally thought you should have kept Brewer, but Brindling wound up having a couple knocks, a couple yeah. RBIs this weekend, um, in, in some tough spots, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think, I think Brewer still is going to get the nod going, but I don't know. AB made it awfully hard. It's going to be interesting to see where this goes. Yeah, and here's the thing, too. Sometimes a shakeup like that is good. And, and Brewer, at, at least, you know, came in in, I guess it was in the second or the second game of the series on Saturday. He did come in and play about the final inning in the field. He didn't take an at-bat, though. But I think Brenling showed you something. Brenling, you know, I think for the weekend he hit 400, and he showed some speed, and I think he showed a lot of things that you're going to really want. And it's good to at least be able to have him as an option. I agree with Hutch. You know, like, they, like you know, they – um, it is a, a question to, to not have Dylan Brewer because Brewer at times has played really well, but when he hit his slump, you know, you saw his skyrocket batting average in non-conference play crater to normality, right? And I think Dylan Brewer might have the sweetest swing on the team in terms of players I like watching just swing a baseball bat. I love his swing. Uh, I, I love his physical buildup, and I, I love what, you know, Dylan Brewer can be. But Austin Brindling at least is giving Mark Kingston something to really chew on this weekend, and, and that is exactly the lineup he's going to be using going forward. And look, if you get your opportunity uh, to make an impression in a game against in a series against the number two team in the country, and you go an entire weekend series and you hit 400 and you're able to score some runs, knock in some runs as well, especially for a team that has struggled to bring runners home all season long, I think you accomplished your mission. And I think, you know, even though you lost to a three, if you want to take away positive takeaways from the series, Austin Brenling is probably the one that's closer to the top of the list. Yeah, sorry about oh, that. No, sorry. There we go. My bad. No audio there. Yeah, apologies. Um, yeah, no. What I, what <laughs> you look like you're making a really good point, though. I mean, you look like you're making I a really good point. I was making a great point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> apologies for that. Um, it is just late on Sunday evening, man. But no, so uh, I, well, what I did say was uh, Eli Jones and, and Matthew Becker are kind of a match made in uh, pitching heaven, if you will. 
And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think they, they're really good together. They worked really good together when lights out, um, you know, all game. Um, for the most part, Becker pin up the win. But, yeah, Jones and Becker, I like them, you know, paired up together, coming out, Becker coming out of the bullpen, shoving. Um, but really, really good stuff. And then it was Parker Nolan uh, with the two RBIs that was the hero with, with mm-hmm. the bat. Yeah, uh, Parker Nolan came in through clutch. Parker Nolan and Talmadge Lee Croy, I thought, had two of the biggest RBIs. Kennedy Jones, although Kennedy Jones there in that second game, a really good job of, of finally hit, hitting something in it with runners in scoring position. And you really needed that because Arkansas was leaving a lot of runners on too. Arkansas, it, what, they didn't have a lack of hits in, in game number two of this series that plagued them. I think they had they kind of pulled a South Carolina with the way they didn't hit very well situationally. And Becker did what you needed him to. Garrett Ganey came in and got you out of a really tough inning in the eighth. And Connor McCreary, to his credit, came in in the ninth and also a really tough situation, a situation where Arkansas could have taken the lead or tied and took care of business. And I think that's the biggest that, – that's a, a big takeaway from the first game on Saturday was you were able to, to, to play good situational baseball. And I and like Martin made the point right now, like Connor McCreary closing the game out, that was no easy task. I thought that – like. Yeah. In that situation with runners on in an offense that like Arkansas is not going to be a top five hitting team in this conference, but they're good situationally. They have the guys that can really make you pay. And McCreary came in in a high pressure spot and was able to close the deal. You need more guys like that. Garrett Ganey's kind of been that guy this year, and Ganey did the same thing in the eighth inning to yeah. get you out of a tough jam. I think, uh, or seventh or eighth inning to get you out of a tough jam. The more of those guys that you can trust in that position, the better. So I thought, you know, Saturday wasn't just a win in the win column. It's a win for your bullpen. And there's a win for some, finally, some situational hitting that was able to bring some runners home. And that's, you know, the good side. That's, you know, maybe uh, the jackal to the hide of this South Carolina team sometimes is, you know, you found some good role players to be able to pitch well at the bullpen. You've got some players in the middle of your lineup to the end of your lineup that took care of business, even though Messina and Petri didn't really necessarily hit that well in the second game. Petri didn't hit well at all this weekend. He didn't hit anything this weekend. He went over 12. Yeah. But to get that type of production from the middle to bottom part of your order uh, really helps, really helps in a situation like that. And that helps you win games against, I don't know, the number two team in the country. Yeah, absolutely. No, and and like I mentioned when we first started talking about this baseball team uh, this weekend, zero home runs. It's a big thing. No power um, this weekend. And I think that's kind of what you needed to beat a team like Arkansas uh, in the full. Oscar mm-hmm. Attaway Jr., Mr. Attaway, checking us out tonight. Appreciate you tuning in on this Sunday Good game night. yesterday. Yes, sir. Um, good game. Yeah, your, your son had a great game yesterday. Um, really, really, you know, pretty good. And, uh, you know, I was impressed exactly what Mike and I had been talking about in the weeks leading up to it. So, um, but yeah, appreciate you tuning in. Uh, Curious if, if if you're still with us, if uh, if you got to make it out to the spring game, if you didn't, um, you know, just kind, of, kind of what you saw from from Oscar. Um, as and I'll, I'll give him a chance to answer this too. Hit some ads real quick, but first, talk to you guys about our good friends over at Liberty Tax. Tax ID is that uncertain feeling you get right before doing your taxes, but you don't have to go through a loan. The tax team at Liberty Tax in Irmo, Lexington, and Columbia walk you through the process, clear up any confusion, and guarantee you'll get the biggest possible refund or your money back. It's tax time. If you're in a hurry for a refund, call them the tax team at Liberty Tax. They're fast, accurate, and guaranteed. On the other hand, if you think you're your own Uncle Sam, talk to the Liberty Tax team to make sure you're not paying more than you should owe. They'll find every possible deduction for you. Locally owned and operated, staffed by tax professionals from your neighborhood, open 9 to 9 weekdays and 9 to 5 on Saturdays with multiple service options. Start through the Liberty Tax mobile app or through their desktop portal. Make an appointment or just walk in. Give a call to upload your tax documents. When you your return, will be ready to review and sign. Give them a call on your screen right now. And for those listening, 803-462-5576. Once again, 803-462-5576. Um, for all of your tax needs this tax season. And our other sponsor of the day is our friend Clint Hammond of the Movement Network. He's above us for all of our GC Live programming. In need of help with your mortgage, call on our good friend Clint Hammond of the Movement Mortgage Network. He's been in the mortgage industry since 2003. He's to help everyone from the first-time home buyer to complicated and complex jumbo buyer, whether you're looking to purchase a new home or refinance. I think it's more important than a well-thought-out financial strategy that comes from five-star customer service. He's even helped out our very own Wes Mitchell and former Gamecock quarterback Perry with, with their mortgages. So give our guy Clint a call. He's above us, 803-771-6933. Once again, on your screen right now. And for those listening, 803-462, or sorry, 803-771-6933. Um, get back into it. Oh, Mr. Attaway did make it make the trip to Columbia. Um, uh, hope your flight and everything and everything, um, your, your game day experience, your first game day experience, 
South Carolina was a good one. Um, but wrapping things up, Elijah, me and Miss Attaway were in attendance. I love it. I love it. I hope awesome. I, I'm, I'm curious to know how uh, how your game day experience was. That'll be interesting to see. And and obviously you hope that the flights and all that stuff uh, went well. Um, coming from Alabama, I believe you guys are located in. Um, but I, I, Mike and I were talking about it the other day. We were itching to get down there and, and try some of your barbecue. Um, so something we need to explore. Um, but Elijah, before we, we close things out, uh, you know, any final thoughts for uh, the, the, your first walkthrough appearance? Anything on the spring game? Baseball could be whatever. Uh, the biggest thing, I guess, for football is, you know, uh, to, to the Gamecock fans, I know that that consume this, you know, religiously, as everybody in the SEC does. Don't, don't, you know, I guess, take too much from it, uh, just because that's how uh, spring games are by design. But there's reason to be excited. You should be excited about Lenora Sellers' athletic ability. You should be excited about your running back room. Uh, even though Rocket Sanders didn't get to play, Oscar Attaway Jr. did get to play, and he played really well. I thought, you know, Josiah played well on the edge. There were ups and downs, but you know what? He's a true freshman, yeah, and he should, you know, he's like what? Was supposed to be preparing for his senior prom, but he was playing in the spring game instead, and I thought he played really well. Dylan Stewart, I say don't try to take too much, but you know what? He played over-exceeded expectation, and you had a really good showing with – uh, def like defensively, I thought, well, you know, the defensive line looks really, really good. And, um, you know, defensive line looked really good. Nick Emmett Worry played really well. There's there's some good takeaways to have. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. And baseball-wise, look, it's tough right now. And it's not going to get any easier because Kentucky is coming in this next weekend. And Kentucky finally looked a little bit vulnerable, but it's because Tennessee came to Lexington and hit like a bajillion home runs against them. And they're like, they're going to come back anger. They're going to try to get another win in a series, which they've done, you know, pretty much all, all season long. Um, it's not, it's not going to get easier. Uh, there's some reason to be concerned um, in, on the, for the baseball team right now, but you know, still plenty to go in the season. Um, but yeah, it was a, a busy sports week in Columbia, a lot to digest, but uh, we got a lot of these moving forward. So excited, excited for football. I'm glad we got to sit here, Joe, and talk, football for an hour you know in, in the spring we're itching for that so it was good to get to do that so if the spring game give us anything at least a little bit of uh excitement to be able to uh to take it into taking into the summer yeah absolutely elijah i love it i'm gonna get uh mr attaway says we enjoy it. we can't wait for, to the season starts and we appreciate all of the kind fans for supporting and welcomoming us that's exactly what you want to hear um, so, so good stuff. Shout out to Game Cognition for making them welcome. Um, that's that's awesome. Um, but so yeah, I, I I'm glad that went well. And um, you know, I guess my final take, I'm, Elijah, I'm equally as glad to, to be back in football, and especially with you, which is why I'm glad you could join me tonight. Um, you know, I think it was a really really good start to the spring. There are a lot of guys that have um, a lot to prove um, this summer, and it's going to be really interesting to see how that shapes out. Um, and, and all the intel and everything on, and who's playing well and whatnot, try to get our best idea of it, um, bring you guys um, all the updates. But, um, yeah, really, really good stuff. And, I mean, baseball has got some work to do. We'll see. Uh, you're home against Kentucky next weekend. This, nobody plays better at, at Founders Park than South Carolina. So I think, you know, they, they need one of those Vandy series against Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I – they the leaders on this team didn't have the best of weekends, so I, I think that's I guess good for you, if you will. Um, because you know, if anyone's going to turn this team around, it's Cole Messina and Ethan Petrie, right? I, those guys love baseball so much that like they're, they're not going to let this season go completely down the drain. Um, so mm -hmm. Elijah, as, as I do with every guest, um, I'll let everyone plug where, wherever you are at and everything. So, so tell the people you're out up to. Oh, absolutely. I, I love nothing more than a good personal plug. But uh, th hey, thanks for having me on. And uh, for everybody, you know, that might be inter getting introduced to me right now, I host a show with Jay Phillips from three to six on 107.5 The Game uh, every Monday to Friday, afternoon drive. And you can join us on our YouTube channel at The Game TV. Uh, so we, we post a lot of good video content on there and on Twitter at E underscore Campbell three. Uh, a lot of, you know, obnoxious basketball and college football takes there all the time. So always join me for the discourse, which I'm never uh, I'm never you know, going to turn down um, and all that good stuff. Won't be on air, I guess, this week, Monday and Tuesday, taking a couple of days off and uh, relaxing a little bit. But we're getting right back to it Wednesday. But, yeah, 107.5 The Game from 3 to 6, myself and Jay Phillips. We try our best to put on a decent show to not bore you on your way home from work or school or wherever you're going from. And at E underscore Campbell 3 for all the goofy college athletics discourse on uh, – um, on Twitter. So, 
anywhere uh, there is good enough for me and look forward to uh, doing this again sometime and getting to interact with everybody Absolutely. that I got to interact with here in the chat and on the show. This is a, for my debut here on the show. I had a pretty good time. Uh, you know, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Awesome. Elijah, I'm glad you had as good of a time as I did. Um, really, really, really good show. You guys go check him out on 107.5 The Game. He's anchoring it down with Jay Phillips. Um, and Elijah, enjoy your couple of days off um, as the show has taken. You were, you were the return episode from a couple of weeks hiatus of the walkthrough. It was perfect. Um, so appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. It was a great episode. Again, for all the discourse and everything, it was wonderful. Um, stay tuned this week. We've got plenty more on Gamecock Central. Like, subscribe, and then hit the bell icon um, in the corner when you do, and you will be notified every time we go live. So appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. Enjoy your weeks, and we will be in touch soon.